Uh, good evening. My name is Larry Calvers. I'm the R. Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics and the Chair of the Department of Accounting. And I guess that's all the chairs I am. So I want to thank Nancy Donovan and her students, Nunia Gozi, Grant Hudson, Ali Ingray, Katie Kingsmore, Diago Orozco, there's only 15 more, Ashke Pansar A, Patrick Pazane, Luigi Remo, and Nick Slanek. Slanek, excuse me, Nick Slanek. All right, cool. Thank you. And I also want to thank uh, Grace Couric Bonchan, who's a CBA communications manager. I don't know if Grace is in the room. Yes, thank you very much. So their help in planning and organizing this has been very good. So the, our, our, uh, the Dryer Chair in Accounting Ethics Distinguished Speaker Series is funded by the R Chair Dryer Chair in Accounting Ethics and is also part of the Institute for Business and Ethics uh, and Sustainability at Loyola Marymount University. I also want to thank Chad and Ginny Dreyer, who are not here tonight, for their tremendous support of our accounting program in the university. Uh, the presentation is going to run about three hours, so I want you to make sure, what? You didn't know that? And the doors will be locked? All right. So, so now it's going to sound OK, because it, it'll be about 45 minutes, and we'll leave some time for Q&A. So students, you don't get any credit unless you stay here at least three hours. So anyway, our speaker tonight is Richard Kravitz. He received his BA in Economics and Spanish Literature with honors from New York University and his MBA from New York University's Stern Graduate School of Business. He's a former president and group publisher of Panel Publishers, Walters Kluwer, executive vice president, group publisher at Aspen Kluwer Law International. Early in his career, Kravitz held audit positions at CBS Inc. and Deloitte Touche, now known as Deloitte period, exactly. He's former editorial advisory board member and contributor to the Financial Fraud Law Report. He's written over 30 articles on ethics and corporate morality, financial fraud, social responsibility, and others. He's the founding director of the Center for Socially Responsible Accounting, protecting the public interest. He's a certified public accountant, a member of the AICPA, New York State Society of CPAs. Uh, he's also a chartered global management accountant, CGMA of the AICPA. He's currently editor-in-chief of the CPA Journal, The Voice of the Profession, and managing director of content and publishing at the New York State of CPAs, Society of CPAs. He is a passionate observer of global corporate behavior. Through his visits with C-suite executives and board members around the world, as global uh, publisher, Kravitz holds unique insight into the behavior and motivations of directors and board members of multinational corporations. Like many of the speakers that I have in this series, he also volunteers to come and talk with some of the faculty members and our students. Uh, tomorrow morning, he's going to be in the accounting ethics class. Who's out there from accounting ethics tomorrow morning? Woo! Shout out. Cool. So sh be there or be square. And uh, so I want you to give him a warm welcome. I think you're going to see a very interesting presentation. So welcome, Rick Kravitz. Well, with all these things that I've uh, done, it makes me look very, very old, I think. Uh, good evening. I really want to thank uh, Dr. Larry Calbers, uh, uh, who holds the R. Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics, who chairs the Department of Accounting, for inviting me to speak. It's a real honor. My presentation tonight is entitled The 10K in the Search for Meaning, Has Financial Reporting Lost Its Way? My opinions, of course, naturally do not reflect the position of the CPA Journal, the NYSSCPA, or their board. And in this presentation, I hope to challenge some of your traditional beliefs in the value of financial reporting. Does financial reporting provide a factual narrative about the health, wealth, and well-being of today's corporation? Does the balance sheet cash flow, earnings, and income statement in accordance with GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, tell the true story 
of how well a company is doing. Whether we should invest in it, whether we should work in it, whether we should sell to it, supply products and services to it, lend it money, or give it tax incentives to bring it into our community. Now, as a financial manager, as outside accountants, as auditors and advisors, the question is, if we follow all those 17,000 pages of rules of the PCAOB, of the SEC, of the DOL, of the FASB, the GASB, the FASABI, and the ASB, that's the AICPA's new rules, the rules and standards of all these regulatory and oversight, uh, oversight bodies, have we improved our understanding of the true value of the modern enterprise? Or should we just acknowledge that the new clarity standards of the FASB, the recodification of dated and obsolete rules, actually ignores the most critical and essential conceptual resources that create long-term sustainable value? So my question is, has financial reporting lost its way? So let's begin our journey, and let's, present, let's, prevent, uh, let's pretend that our guides that we hired are two authors, uh, authors of the book Capitalism Without Capital, Haskell and Westlake. We journey back in time to the medieval ages, where our journey and search of enterprise value begins, where it's the essence of enterprise, its assets, the economic resources that provide benefits over time. It's machinery, it's inventory, it's weaving machines, it's lambs, it's wool, it's corn harvests stored in grain silos, it's hay drying in the fields, it's horses, it's sheep, it's plows, it's oats, it's goats, it's tangible assets. You can touch them, you can smell them, you can feel them, you can taste them. Well, I'm not sure you want to taste a horse, but I think you get the idea. But let's move in our journey, in our history, with a new guide to the year 2000, it's 1912, 1912. Baruch Lev, author of the book, The End of Accounting. And actually, I'd really recommend you reading that. It's a great book. Let's look at the financial report in 1912 of one of the greatest companies in that period, U.S. Steel. Its balance sheet, its income statement, and its cash flow. Clearly, generally accepted accounting principles tells a uniform, and consistent story of the business and financial condition of U.S. Steel. In 1912, gap financial reporting is the pathway to understanding the true value of this company, and it tells the story very well. Assets less liabilities and earnings or book value equals the market cap or market capitalization of the company. And in fact, the ratio of book value to market cap is almost 100%. So I guess you could say GAAP financial reporting. I guess we could say that GAAP nailed U.S. Steel in 1912. But spoiler alert, a year later, stainless steel and galvanized nails are invented, and U.S. Steel begins to grow some rust around its edges. But let's continue our journey another 100 years towards the year 2012, and let's look at the financial statements of U.S. Steel. In fact, it looks very much like it did in 1912. The ratio of its core business, assets less liabilities and earnings, or book value, equals market cap. The ratio is almost 100%, book value to market cap. But many other companies, public companies during this period, were taking a very different path. Their ratio of book value to market cap or market capitalization began to diverge. Still, by the 1950s, there was a 90% correlation or ratio between book value and market cap. But by the 1970s, the ratio, the same ratio, book value to market cap, had dropped down into the 40 to 50% range. And during the years 2000 to 2012, the correlation dropped dramatically to 19%. That is, less than one-fifth of the reported value of the company was measured by its financials. And let's go a little further. Today, the ratio of book value to market cap of some of the top publicly traded companies, companies that you know very well, like Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Facebook, lie in the 4 to 5% range, about a 25 to 1 ratio 
of conceptual or intangible assets to tangible assets. Or another way of looking at it is that 95 to 96% of the value of these enterprises lies outside of their balance sheet, their income statement, their earnings, and cash flow. So here our guide, Baruch Lev, argues that from an investment perspective, financial reporting today contributes only 5 to 6% of the decision-relevant information used by investors. What a loss for accountants' relevance. And as you can see overall for all publicly traded companies in the United States, 84% of the value of a company lies in, in its intangibles. Uh, that's up from 17% in 1975. In fact, that since the 1970s, the investment in non-financial assets, hidden assets, intangibles, outpaced tangible investments by a factor of three to one. So what are these hidden assets, these intangibles? What are these intangibles that financial reporting has missed? What are the strategic resources, the strategic capital that drives the true value of a modern corporation? Well, if you had to distill them in a few words, I'd say we all know what they are. It's knowledge, it's data, it's information, it's ideas. These are the conceptual assets that are not measured. These are the dominant creators of value today. And in fact, the investment in non-financial assets or intangibles at two to three trillion dollars a year is now the dominant creator of corporate value. Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, in fact, commented that between 1977 and 2012, investments in these conceptual assets increased by 60%, while investments in physical or tangible assets dropped by 35%. But a couple of other things are happening as well. There are radical changes in the environment in which what I'd call the, the corporate ecology during this period which also shaped the value and wealth of the modern corporation and its relationship to our global corporate society. The first is the size of the corporation. The second is the concentration of corporate ownership. And the third is referred to as the myth of shareholder ownership, who really owns the company today. The fact is, this is not your parents' world from a corporate perspective. 52 of the largest economies of the world are multinational corporations, not sovereign nations. Let me say that again. 52 of the largest economies of the world are corporations, multinational corporations, not sovereign nations. The market cap of Apple at almost a trillion dollars is larger than all the European Union countries except for two. Walmart employs 2.7 million people. That's half the population of New Zealand. The top 2,000 public companies employ over 87 million people. Only 15 out of 233 countries exceed this number. The top 2,000 public companies generate over 50% of the world's GDP. Only five countries combined, including the United States and China, exceed this number. It is a fact that corporations run schools, prisons, nuclear power plants, provide food, clothing, and shelter to society. They serve in the military, run defense establishments, and a corporation can have more impact on its citizens, on sovereign nations, than they can on than the government can today. Now there's nothing sinister here, but the fact is that the modern global corporation mirrors society, and society mirrors the modern corporation. And for example, how do you connect with friends and family? Do you see them? Do you meet them? Or do you use Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter or other social media? So why do we call these conceptual assets or strategic assets? Why, why around the world do we call them capitals? Well, actually, the discussion began in the United States about 20 years ago, but it took leaders of the integrated reporting field in the EU to think about how to identify, how to measure, how to monitor, and how to report on corporate wealth 
from a non-financial perspective. And Paul Druckmann at the International Integrated Reporting Council in the Netherlands argued, for too long, businesses have only expressed themselves in terms of financial transactions, an exclusive form of communication that hides from view the rich seams of value that can be find, found in knowledge, intellect, natural resources, and relationships. These rich streams of value are expressed by the additional capitals. And from a global perspective, Mervyn King, founder of the IARC, describes this as the evolution of thinking from financial capitalism to sustainable capitalism, which is absolutely believed today to be the essence of corporate value. Actually, I spoke to Mervyn. He's in South Africa. He was actually the uh, youngest chief justice of the South African Supreme Court. And I told him that I was, and we've done some conferences together. I told him that I was going to, uh, going to be speaking uh, with you today. And he said that he just wanted to send his regards and also thank you for listening to his message. But here, Mervyn King looks at the value of the modern corporation no longer as share value, but shared values, which is a stakeholder-centric approach. He argues that value is created by and for all stakeholders. All parties impact the health, the wealth, and the long-term value of the corporation. The employees, whether they're owned or outsourced, investors, shareholders, management, bondholders, suppliers, vendors, and the community at large. So what are these hidden assets that do not exist on the balance sheet for financial statements of global corporations? Let's take a, a deep look at this. Let's look at ethical and moral capital, that is strategic capital, the good and the bad of corporate governance, the value creators and the value destroyers, from the abusers like Wells Fargo, who sent two million credit cards to poor people, to Prudential Insurance, who use these cards to sell life insurance, to Equifax, to Facebook, and others. But on the other hand, they're also excellent companies, acknowledged by their employees as the best governed, who have the highest standards of confidence in their executive management. It's companies like Costco, and you could look this up and look up on Glassdoor, some of these companies, and the confidence they have in their CEOs. Costco and Home Depot and J.P. Morgan in BlackRock and others. Let's look at intellectual capital. Patents, trademarks, brand identity, skilled and talented workforce, a smart workforce, business method patents, business processes, technology. It's the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Ubers, the Lyfts are examples of companies with negligible balance sheets relative to market cap. Reputational capital, brand, brand identity, reputation, what the brand stands for, how it is perceived in the media and in social media. It is one of the greatest creators of value, but it also carries with it one of the greatest risks for value destruction. Watch Amazon, for example. Over the past two weeks, it lost over $106 billion of your parents and your 401k money due to the reputational damage from both Washington and Seattle. Manufactured capital. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about this later towards the end, because I will demonstrate how this capital, more than any other capital, impacts the postmodern capitalist enterprise in the United States, since we outsource most of our manufactured goods. Human capital. The range of issues are huge. Talent, institutional knowledge, intelligent business processes, it's also work safety, it's accidents in the workplace, it's employees you don't own, it's respect for human rights. Now, how many of you are familiar with the new law passed in California that impacts corporations in this area? It's human, it's human trafficking, it's forced labor, it's slavery, it's employment of underage workers. And there's, there's an act that was passed in California very recently that asked corporations to address this. Human capital drives intangible value, and it is not measured in the financials as an asset. Financial capital, well, we really discuss this. Social and relationship capital. How do we connect with society? How our community, by providing education, 
health care, facilities, roads, and services supports the corporation. Now, still critics will say, well, what is the connection between community and corporation? And I would present General Motors and the city of Detroit as just one example. Unemployed workers do not pay taxes. If there's less taxes, there's less money to pay for safety, for health, for education, and welfare of the community. When corporations fail, it is, not, is it not our collective society that is forced to cover the shortfall? Now, personally, I kept an apartment in The Hague in the Netherlands, and for almost six years headed the largest English language international legal business publisher in the world, Clure Law International. And we also covered the criminal law uh, proceedings uh, uh, for the UN Court of Justice in The Hague. But what struck me most about Dutch society was that corporations were part of a global society. As it is in Europe, in many of the countries, societies of communities, government, employees, and corporate executives in their work council of executives, employees, and government search for collective solutions to issues of face, facing corporations and society. They search for collective solutions. What a crazy idea from these canal diggers in the Netherlands that everybody in society should work together for the common good. What a crazy idea to make the world a better place. And how many of you should send that note to our, our officials in Washington? What a crazy idea to make this world a better place. Natural capital, what effect does society or corporate society have on the planet? And what effect does the planet have on corporate society? I, I won't go any further than that in this area. So as accountants, how do we currently value these strategic resources? Well, the fact of the matter is we really don't do a very good job of this. In fact, we hide this from the public. We hide from the public conceptual assets. We expense them. We hide them from the balance sheet. They're buried in SG&A, sales or selling general and expen administrative expenses or cost of sales, with the exception of those conceptual assets that we actually acquire or book on the balance sheet. The fact is that the way corporate entities are valued today in the market today lies outside of the traditional boundary of financial accounting and financial reporting. And astonishingly, we discussed this before, in 2018 recently, the FASB dropped plans to discuss intangibles in its list of emerging issues. But global critics aren't that forgiving. Paul Cherry, chairman of the International Accounting Board Advisory Council remarked, we have an antiquated system, an antiquated conceptual framework. It's like substance abuse. You have to admit you have a serious problem, and chipping away at the edges is just not going to solve it. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's take the other side for the moment. Let's put in our traditional Milton Friedman Chicago hats, investor shareholder hat, bold followers of Milton Friedman, unabashed capitalism. Read the current books in modern finance. Who cares about these intangibles? It's about earnings. It's about profits. That's what capitalism is all about. There are winners and there are losers. Non-financial metrics, well, they're for tree huggers. They're for palm oil haters, cocoa bean planters. Pay coffee bean growers as little as you can. Charge customers as much as you can. Well, that's not really the case. Because if financial capital governs today, then how do we reconcile the billions and billions of dollars lost in value to the reputational damage, say, of Chipotle Grill, in three days, they lost half their value. Farm-to-table sourcing, farm-to-table E. coli lost their value in three days. Or how about Uber? They decided in their new iteration that, uh, that they could save money by reducing the number of sensors in their driverless cars in Arizona, and they killed somebody. Or Wells Fargo or Equifax, overall losses in the hundreds of billions of dollars of your parents or your 401k plan. And let's look at the poster child for bad reporting. You may remember that this top blue chip stock lost half its value by 2017. Do you know which one it was? Okay, 
hint. A light bulb will go off if you think hard about this company. Incidentally, GE doesn't make light bulbs anymore. And in fact, I don't believe any US company makes light bulbs in the United States anymore. But back to GE. A little over a year ago, we're told by CEO Jeff Immel, he's pleased to tell shareholders that GE had a great year. The 10K of GE showed great financial strength, hitting its financial targets. Nine months later, the new CEO, Tim Flannery, comes in, and he reports unacceptable, disappointing results. Company has serious difficulties. So what do the critics say? Well, Baruch Lev was in our TV studios in February, and he argued that unlike the 10K, an integrated report, that is a report on all these capitals, would have indicated five years ago, three years ago, one year ago, that there was something fundamentally wrong with this company. And I would argue that the fact that GE lost half its value, it is not a victimless crime. It destroyed the security and the financial lives of hundreds of thousands of GE retirees. And regarding the Great Recession, the, the, the catastrophic fall of Lehman and others, we exported starvation to third world countries in unemployment. The fact is, these are not victimless crimes. Hundreds of thousands of GE retirees depended on GE stock for their retirement security to pay medical bills, food, clothing, and shelter. Who picks this up but the collective society? Who pays Medicaid? Who pays food stamps? And what is the social cost of their children not being able to afford college tuition? Well, John Bogle also talked about GE. John is the founder of the Vanguard Group, one of the five largest pension fund managers in the States. And Bogle reported that GE's market cap, once the largest corporation in the world, fell by $420 billion, likely the largest decline in a company's market value in history, almost half a trillion dollars. Now, did you read this in the Wall Street Journal or anything? The largest destruction of value in, in one year. Got this right this time. Now, I also mentioned other ecological changes in the global corporation landscape. It's about stock ownership. John Bogle, December 7th last year, reported that ownership of stock by individuals over the past 85 years plunged from 92% in 95 to 27% today. Institutions only owns 8% of publicly held companies in 1945. 1982, 50% over 73% today. In the United Kingdom, only 7% of shareholders actually own individual stocks. The fact is that 90 million Americans own US listed companies through their pension plans. And Bogle argues strong corporate governance provides a bridge between of trust between Wall Street and Main Street. This also explodes the myth, according to Bogle, that corporate governance lacks relevance to society. But let's explode one other myth, and that's the myth in our modern, that we read about in our modern corporate finance books. The third revolutionary change that we need to understand, that's the myth of shareholder ownership. The fact is that you or your parents really do not own the corporation. And when they do, it's not for very long. Think about it. If you're one of the 90 or 93 million shareholders today in a pension fund, you can't go into one of your pension fund corporations and take their pencils. No court has found a shareholder in a pension plan guilty of theft from a company. And if you buy their stock, it doesn't go into their coffers. It doesn't increase their ability to use your money or to hire more employees. And if you sell the stock, they don't care. And frankly, if they go bankrupt, you're wiped out by creditors and bondholders or by accountants and attorneys who are in first in line to get paid. They have greater ownership rights than you. So as Mervyn King, head of IARC, explains, corporations are really incapacitated human beings. And like children, they need to be governed. 
And finally, how, a myth of shareholder ownership. How long do you think your parents or your, in your pension fund own stock in one of the thousands of companies in their portfolio today? And I think this will astound you. In his 12-year study on the myth of shareholder ownership, according to Professor of Finance Primsika at Essex in the UK, the average time a shareholder owns stock in a US public company through micro trading is 22 seconds. Five years ago, the average time a shareholder owned stock in a New York stock exchange company was three to five months. Think about it. You are a pension holder. You own stock. You don't vote for the CEO. You don't vote for the executive. You don't vote for their compensation. And clearly, you don't vote for uh, their auditor. And as you will remember, GE, under investigation by the SEC for fraudulent financial reporting, if you own GE stock in your pension fund for those 22 seconds, I guarantee you didn't vote for the 110th year to re replace, to keep the, uh, the same auditors as, as uh, GE had in the past. And here's just another side note, a diversion. According to Vogel, during this period of time, which really talks about the separation of the corporation from society, CEO compensation, again, you don't vote for that compensation. CEO compensation since 1980 has risen by more than 560% in real terms. This is Vogel at Vanguard. While the compensation of the average worker in America increased by less than 1% a year, or 14% over the uh, 36 years. As Bogle says, the disparity is both economically indefensible and morally irresponsible. And that's part of the connection between society and, and the corporation. So let's put this all together, if I can find the right slide. This is, uh, let's take a look at how we could have you ever, any of you seen the, uh, the octopus in GRI or IRC, the model? I, I changed it just a little. But let's take a look how we can integrate all of the capitals in a stakeholder-centric approach in what we call the octopus model. Uh, these, are, these are the legs. Um, actually, it's an accounting equation that IIRC and GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, use to look at the capitals. On the left are strategic inputs, and on the right are the consequences of strategic investments, and in the center is strategy, resource allocation, and governance. Now, we, we all call this the octopus model, but if you're counting, this octopus only has six legs, and it's actually a septopus, but I think if you went into a fish store and asked for a septopus, they wouldn't know what you're talking about, so octopus it is. But conceptually, this is really an equation. Inputs equal outputs plus value creation or long-term increases in the sustainable value of the enterprise. Now, as accountants and financial analysts and financial managers, we can understand this as an equation. And we could learn to identify, to monitor, to measure, and to report on these capitals. And in fact, we could actually even develop a model that balances long-term shareholder wealth against perhaps long-term value destruction by lack of attention to these capitals. Now, incidentally, if we think this is totally conceptual, in, the 19, in 2014, the European Union passed the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which requires all public companies effective this year, January 2018, to identify these non-financial assets impacting the public corporation and the consequences of their action, the good, the bad, and the ugly. How many of you have heard about it? All EU companies, all US multinationals doing business in the EU and the UK have to report on these capitals. It, requir it requires disclosure by all US public companies of non-financial matters and outcomes. Each country, by the way, is, is tailoring their own EU non-financial reporting directive slightly different. But here's some of the things that it covers. The question is, can you measure this? Well, we can measure employee turnover. We can measure confidence in their CEO. We can measure issues of 
Are they engaging in, in human rights violations, slavery, forced labor in the supply chain? And this is in the EU directive. It includes identifying employment, turnover in terms of gender and age, number of women in managerial and executive positions, and salaries in the highest to lowest. How many companies in America do this? How many companies would volunteer to do this? Now, the final segment, I wanted to do a deep dive into manufactured capital. We talked about value creation, but in the last segment, I want to do a deep dive on intangible risk and the potential for value destruction. How hidden risk can lead to value destruction greater than all of the other capitals combined. And that is because of what I mentioned before. We source most of our goods in the United States from outside the United States. So very quickly, let's look down the supply chain. And by the way, how many of you study supply chain or ERM, enterprise risk management, in your, your finance courses, your accounting courses? A few weeks ago, the AICPA, March 2018, came out with a study that said only 22% of financial managers pay serious attention to this enterprise risk. Only 31% of senior executives and boards of directors realize the uncertainty in the global business environment is outpacing the ability of their organization's traditional approach to managing risk. And the classic example explains why in London the chicken could not cross the road. Seems like Kentucky, have, how many of you heard, have you read about this? How many, Kentucky Fried Chicken had a shutter, most, the majority of its 800 stores for a number of weeks due to a chicken shortage in London. Actually, 6,000 chickens had supplied live chickens, but the new distributing firm, DHL, and these guys were great at shipping normal merchandise. Think of like Amazon Prime being asked to ship fresh chickens in cardboard boxes. Well, DHL contracted to do it, but couldn't figure out how to distribute the live chickens in their, I guess you'd call it a clucking, trucking network. But I guess the managers of KFC probably used a different word than clucking to DHL. But then there was, what was even more disturbing is, then there was a gravy shortage. Now, how can you have chicken without gravy? The point is that millions of dollars were lost. KFC did not pay attention to its supply chain. Huge value destruction in the UK. And how do you dispose of millions of overripe chickens? Well, I could tell you honestly that the government would not let the chickens cross the road. So let's go through some of these slides quickly to give you a sense of the critical importance of the manufactured capital and hidden intangible risk that, that inattention to supply chain can generate. And by the way, I will say this, for those of you who are going into work for companies or, or firms, supply chain management is one of the greatest practice growth areas for accountants and financial managers and financial analysts uh, than any other practice growth area today. Of course, it's outside the United States. And companies like ERM, who are in the United States, who have 150 offices around the world in brown and brown, are larger than most accounting firms, larger than most US global CPA firms. And they provide supply chain assurance down the supply chain to over 40% of public companies outside the United States. This is a great practice growth area. It could be a lot of fun traveling around the world following the supply chain and making sure that codes of conduct are adhered to and that there's, there's no you know, a, a, a rights that are violated. And by the way, they employ CPAs and other financial professionals. In the United States, we just don't get it. Just quickly, these issues relate to supply chain risk and employees and subcontractors who are not owned by the corporation third-party manufacturers, third-world goods and services, from agricultural agriculture to mining. And in fact, inattention to supply chain management is, is a greater risk than anything that is physically owned. It could cause more long-term value creation and more long-term value destruction than anything else. So what are some of the risks? 
Well, the geopolitical, how about the China trade wars and the loss of, uh, of, of billions of dollars by Amazon, supply outages, risk of foreign appropriation. And let's not underestimate the reputational damage. If, for example, and I like to use this as a very special example, if your generation decides that forced labor and underage workers and suicides by Foxconn assembly wine workers who manufacture iPhones in China is no longer acceptable corporate behavior. What's going to happen to that 95 to 1 market cap of Apple? Or what if some of you go out and create an American phone made in America with American parts and pay high labor for that to be made? What is the reputational damage that could occur to a company like Apple that has a 95 to 1 market cap leverage? So again, supply chain is, is a major issue, especially because of the way our markets are crafted today. And incidentally, more than 90% of the respondents from the World Economic Forum reported that supply chain risk has taken a greater priority over the last couple of years. And supply chain risk impacts all the other capitals combined from Facebook to Hershey's cocoa harvesting to chocolate harvesting. Oh, and why did I put Facebook there? Well, Facebook has offices in Hong Kong. They have offices in Dublin. They have offices in London, in Mumbai, in Tel Aviv. And what if those governments decide that privacy matters, that Facebook does not belong in their culture? What is the geopolitical risk, and what is the intangible damage that could be caused to Facebook if these governments decide that privacy matters. In the 401k uh, report, and it's required by the SEC, uh, we report on conflict minerals. But in the biotech, in the pharma industry, in the high tech industry, do we really know where these minerals come from? And when we outsource all of our supply, because we don't manufacture uh, 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 rare earth minerals in the United States. Do we follow the supply chain of subcontractors and sub-subcontractors, and do we know whether any violations actually occur? Are we aware of the distribution channels that can hammer a company? I mean, we talked about KFC, we talked about Chipotle Grill, but how about Perry's ice cream? Anybody know about Perry's? If you look on the AICPA website, it's the poster child for sustainability reporting. They, they make about two thirds or three quarters of all the ice cream in New York State. But oops, spoiler alert, eight years ago, there was peanut butter contamination down their supply chain. They had to recall all their ice cream. I'm sorry, that was not on the AICPA website. They didn't pay attention to supply chain sourcing. And how about the impact of supply chain disruption on industries such as manufacturing, food production, electronics? The question I ask you, is it a matter of time before US chicken producers who raise chickens in the United States and process them in China today miss a batch and comes back contaminated? Is it just a matter of time before the inattention to supply chain risk creates significant value destruction of those companies. And can we ignore social media and the value destruction resulting from reputational damages in these hot fashion, high visibility, high buzz industries? And effectively, all of our fashion today is manufactured outside of the United States. And are these companies really, this is from the Sustainability Consortium, are these companies really confident that they have a handle on this? And it doesn't appear to be so. Only 20%, one-fifth of the companies feel they have a comprehensive view of supply chain sustainability performance. Now, when you work in an outside assurance firm, an auditing firm, or within a company, and you go to work for some of these companies, these are questions that you need to raise as, as financial managers, as accountants, as advisors, as, as financial professionals. And here's where it matters. When market cap exceeds book value, 
from five to 95 to one, it can destroy corporate value. And finally, other than accountants trained in the tools of measurement, who can identify, who can measure, who can monitor, and who can report on intangibles? And as uh, my colleague Jane Gleason White from Australia writes, there might be one hope for life on Earth, and that is accountants. And Jane, incidentally, is in our video series. Uh, if you ever go to cpajournal.com, it's open access. And I, I do this series called Voices of the Profession. And Jane is in our one of our Voices of the Profession series. Who other than accountants can save the planet? So let's recap our five points. We looked at how financial capital and financial reporting became unhinged from the value or market cap of the public companies by a factor of from up to 25, in fact, 95 to 1. Two, we identified the largest economies of the world today as corporations, not sovereign nations. Incapacitated children. How corporations mirror society and how society mirrors corporations. We can't leave these corporations alone. Three, we identified the rich st streams of capital that lie outside of the 10K in financial reporting. Four, we looked at public companies and the concentration of stock ownership, how institutional ownership has changed over the past 85 years and presented a myth that modern corporate finance books still perpetuate, the myth of shareholder ownership. And finally, we looked at manufactured capital in depth, its relation to hidden risk and the potential value destruction down the supply chain. And my final point today, is that as the next generation, you have a lot of work to do as accountants, as finance majors, as financial and risk managers, and outside advisors to bring out the rich seams of value in a company and to figure out how to identify, to measure, to monitor, and report on non-financial assets. And moreover, if we understand the value and hidden risk in non-financial measures within the corporate structure and deepen our risk registers in the corporations that you will work for and lead, you can create strategic long-term value, sustainable value, not only for your generation, but for the generations that come after you. Thank you very much. OK, we have about 10 minutes for some questions from the audience. Who's going to be first? One at a time now. Ah, way up in the back. Thank you for your talk, first of all. It's uh, very interesting. And uh, my question. My question is, uh, how much control should we demand corporations to have over the foreign subcontractors they choose to work with? Um, we must understand that their labor laws in foreign countries are different than ours, and many families actually rely on the money their children are able to bring to the household. So when it comes to the supply chain, um, right, what's that, like a right way to work with that? Excellent, excellent point. And, and there are some very good companies, for example, that recognize that underage children have to work and cover some of the family costs. And what they do in India and other countries is they bring in teachers to teach the kids. They give them scholarships so they could ultimately go to uh, uh, colleges and, and, and escape the cycle of poverty. It's an excellent question. The second is there's codes of conduct that a lot of biopharma and, and apparel industry companies require codes of conduct that need to be assigned down the supply chain to ensure compliance with this. So your, your questions are both good. But corporations have a responsibility, even with underage children that need to work and provide food for their families, to also take care of the collective society in that community to, to ensure that they have a future. Thank you very much.
Would you say the, this, this is suggesting a more holistic approach to financial reporting, obviously taking in a lot of intangible factors. Is the goal to have a, a better correlation between financial reporting and market capitalization, or is it to try and drive a different definition of a company's value? I think uh, if you take a look at the EU directive, I think it's the latter. Basically, you may not be able to add these back to financial capital, but you need to consider these other capitals as equally or of greater importance. And in the non-financial reporting directives of the EU, information they talk about, the management report should have a description of the group's business model, its policies, its employment, its social impact on society, its respect for human rights, its anti-corruption and bribery measures. And last year, actually, 26 corporations paid more fines in the FATCA rule, in the FATCA area than any any time in history. So, and this is principally outside the United States. So I would say it's not, it's not to increase financial capital, but to recognize that intangibles are a, a critically important part of, of, of the corporate ecology and that we need to pay attention to them. We need to measure them, we need to monitor them, we need to report on them. Because that's part of the responsibility that corporations have to society and the society have to the corporations. So Rick, I know you have to go back to the East Coast. I, I'd like to give you some big heavy coat for back there, but we have, you know, like T-shirts and some hats and, and uh, LMU stuff for you to wear when you go back. And again, we'd really like to thank you for joining us. So we do have some refreshments outside in the lobby, so please hang out for a little while. And if you'd like to talk with Rick, uh, please do so. Thanks for coming.